<laughs> no, cut that. <laughs> I'm Liam Foley, and I'm the main level designer for Clan Wars. The Genesis Clan Wars, it's apocalyptic sci-fi. The ruins of the old world have been buried under five centuries of ash and human, human quote-unquote progress. Um, and they are still present and relevant, but the game is also focused on what we used to call primal punk. Um, it's uh, a vision of a, a primal society that's struggling to keep itself afloat. First and foremost, dark, gritty, lethal punishing was a set of words that Marco threw on a whiteboard at the start of development and demanded that we stick to for the rest of the development. Um, for me, making the game dark, gritty, lethal punishing meant that everything the players do has to embody these aspects. It has to have meaning, it has to have risk, and their choices have to have consequences. Uh, when I'm designing the campaign, the missions can't be generic or meaningless. There's no fetch quest to fetch 20 bear asses to go clothe a bunch of people back in the city. It's meaningful things that the players are accomplishing. And similarly, if they fail, then it's a meaningful loss. I think it's important that players feel empowered, but it needs to be both sets of players. So in the game, uh, operatives versus hostile, both have to feel like they can do something. Um, this was something that we ran into in development quite often, was we needed to set the balance very carefully, where the operatives had to feel like they had a chance to go up against these hordes of hostile units. And similarly, the hostile couldn't feel like they were just there as nothing more than a speed bump for the, the other players. Um, so that meant things like giving both sides objectives to complete, uh, both the operatives and the hostile have objectives because the hostile is an active participant in the war as well and not just there to be a punching bag for the other players. Designing for player choice was an interesting problem um, because there's so many different possibilities uh, within the game. Uh, you know, I have to think about what state the operatives might be in by the time they reach a mission. Have they gone on different side branches? Have they unlocked certain operatives? Um, it means bearing in mind that uh, not everyone is going to want to play all of the side content. They might just want to steamroll their way to the finish. Um, and keeping that sort of idea alive all throughout and providing options to keep the momentum going for the, all of the players. In the setting of the Genesis Clan Wars, the cults are 13 uh, powerful organizations, power structures, that have a monopolistic hold on some part of society. As an example, uh, the Chroniclers are a technophiliac faction who are obsessed with uh, a sort of super internet that existed before the apocalypse, and they've dedicated themselves to reigniting it. And so, they have a stranglehold on technology and uh, the higher tech artifacts of the, the world long gone. In game, the cults are represented in the operatives. Each operative is beholden to one of the cults and that dictates certain uh, options that they have. Uh, you can only access the, poten the potentials and items of your own cult. Um, so it provides a sort of background for each operative, and it also influences their gameplay. A lot of the cults tend to have kind of archetypal ideals. The Spitalians are the healers, but once you start digging a little bit deeper into uh, the operatives themselves, you start to find that they are twisting that idea a little bit. So for example, Timur, the starting Spitalian, he is a healer, but he's also a very powerful fighter who has access to for example, a fungicide rifle, which is a sort of, you can imagine it as a chemical flamethrower that gives him a really powerful ability to deny area to the hostile. Um, and that's kind of part of what we did all throughout was we really wanted to take the, the archetypal idea, the, the sort of the most 
basic idea of some sort of cult or some sort of character archetype, like an assassin, and then twist it a little bit so that it's more interesting than just the baseline. The cults, when they coalesced to form the protectorate, uh, it was a violent process. They expelled a large number of more savage tribes who wouldn't comply with their ideas of what civilization is uh, and kicked them out to the margins of their civilization and kind of just assumed that that would be the end of it. And of course they were wrong because the clans survived, re regrew, rebirthed themselves, you might say, and are now back with a vengeance. Um, they are hell-bent on taking revenge on the Protectorate. They'll stop at nothing until one side is wiped out. The Protectorate grew too fast for its own good and didn't stop to think about what it was doing, and now it's paying the price. One of the mechanics that I enjoyed the most was the map system that Renar developed. He came up with this absolutely fantastic system that allows for a small number of modular pieces to be combined together in a huge variety of ways. And when I was developing the missions, I found it really exciting to think about how each landscape would influence the missions that took place in it. So for example, um, a rocky landscape that's cut through with valleys will cause choke points to form that the operatives may be able to use as ambush points or similar. And the system was just so versatile that I really could make just about anything that I wanted with no repetition or, uh, you know, sort of elements that you see over and over again. And I find that really exciting to use. On the one hand, it was fantastic because I didn't have to get involved in the nitty gritty of all of the numbers and maths. Uh, on the other, Renard is very protective of his uh, spreadsheets. Uh, he places everything in its proper place, and he has all of his numbers locked in perfectly. And I am not permitted to mess with his spreadsheets. Uh, I must submit a plea to the great overlord of the game engine if I ever want to change anything. Which, to be honest, I think was uh, actually, jokes aside, I think it was a wonderful cooperation um, because it really played to each of our strengths. Renard did a fantastic job with the game. I think the engine is fantastic. It's really smooth. It's really coherent all throughout. And that meant that when I got handed all of the bits of this game engine, I could really just use it like a playground. I could really go to town and just stick things together and it would all just kind of work out. I got given all of the Lego pieces and I got left to build up whatever I wanted. It was very important to make sure that both the operatives and the hostile got more powerful as the game progressed. They needed to feel on both sides like they were growing, like the challenge they were facing was also growing, um, but not at an insurmountable rate. And it was quite an interesting and difficult problem to make sure that both of them felt good to each other without overpowering one side. For the operatives, we accomplished this by expanding their individual skill set so they unlock new potentials that makes them both have more health to endure damage with but also gives them unique abilities and special skills they can access uh, also they can gain access to new items that give them new tools powerful tools to influence the world and finally by unlocking new operatives uh, they can go on these recruitment missions that gives them the chance to bring allies to their side that maybe bring a new skill set they don't have access to for now. Meanwhile, on the hostile side, uh, the hostile gains access to new units. They start out with only a few uh, units available, sort of weaker uh, legion type enemies that are kind of expendable. And slowly throughout the missions, they gain access to more of their own roster. They start to be able to use champion units that are powerful enough in their own right to go toe to toe with the operatives for a while. And they also unlock swarm cards, which are special abilities that they can activate to really twist the tide in their favor for a few rounds or similar. And by making sure that both of these systems are 
uh, progressing throughout the campaign, both sides feel like they are getting stronger and they recognize that their opponents are getting stronger. The operatives go into a mission with their own objectives, they have their quests to complete uh, and their own activities to do. But it was very important to us to make sure that the hostile didn't feel like they were just a punching bag for the other players. The hostile has to be an active participant in this game. And so the hostile also has their own objectives. There's a kind of implied objective all throughout that they're trying to kill the operatives, and that's true. But also, for example, they might be trying to scout out a location for their attack force or recover uh, the bodies of uh, a certain enemy that has been brought down. And by completing these side objectives, the hostile gains access to their own increases of strength. It was very exciting because I had a lot of room to play with and it, I, it was kind of left all up to me to be, okay, what terrain do I want this mission to take place in? And then from there, represent that on the map. Challenge-wise, the first challenge was that if a map isn't placed on a, uh, a certain aspect ratio, Marco doesn't like it. Um, so I had to make sure that all of the maps fit into a certain space that was 90 by 60 centimeters. Um, and as long as I did that, he was generally happy. Um, after that, the main problem we... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> After, after making sure that the aspect ratio was correct, uh, the next problem I ran into was making sure that um, making sure that they were all unique um, and making sure that no one tile was used too many times. For example, there was an early development. I, I found myself, I really loved this one certain tile and it showed up in every map and it became a, a very sort of boring aspect. So I went back, redesigned them all, made sure that they were all feeling very unique and ended up with what I think turned out to be a pretty cool selection of maps. Each operative begins the game with two potentials, and each potential is a special ability that they have access to or a special bonus that they can use in certain situations. Uh, but the potential system is a hugely multifaceted part of the game because beyond just special bonuses that they can unlock, that they grow in power with, the potentials also serve as a means to track their health. Whenever an operative takes damage, they resist it, they soak it by taking a flesh wound, and that's done by flipping a potential over. They lose access to the bonus, but they're still alive. And if all of their potentials are flipped over to flesh wounds, they start discarding their potentials. And if they discard all of their potentials, then they're dead. I think Renard did a fantastic job when he came up with it. Um, so beyond just special bonuses, they're also a health system. And beyond that, they're also a means for us to give the operatives a chance to track their experience. Operatives who have uh, accrued five potentials, which is the maximum, uh, they've really gone through like a whole story to get to that point. They've endured a lot of hardship to get there. And whenever you start losing potentials, it's both, it feels like a big loss because you've become weaker, but also it's another chance to grow as a character. You can maybe choose a different potential this time. Um, so I think the, the system is fascinating. I think it's a really cool part of the, the gameplay. The hostile throughout the, the campaign uh, gains access to new units. So they begin with just a few feeder type enemies, the you know the the sort of weaklings that the operatives can kind of brush aside. The goblins, exactly the the goblins, the the mooks, and as the campaign progresses, they start to add more and more into their roster, more powerful units, more dangerous units that have their own special abilities. Uh, at certain points in the campaign, the hostile gains access to champion units, which are these iconic figures in their own right. They're, they're kind of like the hostiles equivalent to the operatives, and they can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the operatives for a little while. Um, and finally, the hostile also gains access to some special features, especially as they go deeper in the campaign. For example, 
the hostile in one mission might be able to move a certain number of units without spending their own resource um, because the, the swarm is riled up and really gunning for blood. And by combining all of these systems, the hostile can feel like they're getting stronger as the operatives are getting stronger themselves. Uh, and we want to really make sure that they both feel like they're kind of keeping pace with each other to get to this final conclusion of the campaign where they get to really unleash all of their might on each other. Without spoiling, I had a really fun time developing some of the missions in the second act of the game, because at that point, the players have really established themselves, they understand the mechanics, and at that point, that means I'm allowed to kind of get a little bit weird with some of them. Uh, the mission that I think I enjoyed designing the most is, without spoiling too much of it, uh, a stealth mission where the players are trying to sneak up on their enemy and are suddenly faced with the realization that they're facing down a huge horde and they have to try and get away from that without being seen. Um, I think that's a really fun mission. I think it's tense. I think it's, uh, I think it gives like a really good moment to the players. So I'm pretty proud of that one. I think the most fundamental system that combines the setting with the, the system in a really fun way is Intel. So at the beginning of every mission, the players are given, the operatives rather, are given the opportunity to barter with the hostile effectively. Um, they have the chance to unlock some gameplay benefits that are specific to the mission they're about to go on. For example, uh, they might have access to certain resources that they wouldn't have otherwise because they've been clued in by a forward observer from their allies. But in exchange, the hostile will then be given an arcana, which is a powerful resource in its own right. And by making sure that the system gives the players a chance to kind of understand the setting and decide whether they want to invest in a, an Intel piece for the gameplay benefit, or uh, perhaps realize this Intel is telling us that there's a technological resource and we no longer have access to our chronicler because he died two missions ago. We should stay back from this one. I think that means that players can become invested in the story and prove that they understand what's going on and be rewarded for that, which I think is a fascinating mechanic. Actually, uh, no. I think there were some challenges when it came to the game design. Uh, there were some challenges with the uh, mission balance and similar, but Degenesis' setting is so coherent and consistent and well thought out all throughout uh, that when it comes to making sure that the setting matched up well, um, we were able to kind of lock down the particulars of the, the story quite early. And from there, it was kind of a case of making sure that it was respected, that it was well enough integrated, and that we had provided enough like meat on the bones of the, the mechanics to give like a really good flavor to everything that was going on. It's honestly one of the best experiences I could have had. Um, I was a huge fan of the Genesis Rebirth before I was even brought on board. And being able to take part in the creation of something like this where a project that I was so involved with is now completely refactored into a new form um, and being able to, to really influence that and make sure that it's as good as I would want it to be as a fan, it, there, there's nothing better uh, than that in my opinion. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think people are scared of what they don't understand and frankly, the amount of alcohol that Marco consumes on a daily basis is not understandable to any mortal person. So I think the fear is understandable and that manifests as, uh, you know, anger. Personally, I hugely prefer the hostile. Part of that is probably because uh, I have already got this 
sort of overlord's view of the entire campaign. I built the entire thing. I know every plot twist. I know every mission in, in and out by heart. But I also really enjoy the, the different perspective that it gives. The operatives are very much tightly focused on themselves. The hostile gets this kind of broad overview. I know everything that's going on in the map. I can set up really unique tactics and strategies with my units. Um, and I really enjoy that. And I'm way too bad at playing actual real-time strategy games on my PC. So this is a fun way of getting that fixed. I think to new players, um, I think really just dive into the game. Uh, try not to be scared of the mechanics. They, they, you know, you, you'll pick them up really quickly. The game is so easily learned. The onboarding process is so smooth. I think the advice is just set up your first game, try and understand everything you need to do, and then go for it. And try not to be too scared of doing something because the best choice to make is making a choice. And if you do nothing, then you'll never go forward. You're welcome. <laughs>